So when we started the course, we kind of decided that uh, North Africa, uh, its status as being part of the Middle East is somewhat debatable. Uh, I don't know if I'd put it that way. I think it depends on uh, the kind of history you're telling. In other words, you could you could pretty easily write a, a book on the history of North Africa where uh, you don't really pull in the Middle East that much. Uh, and conversely, you could also write a history of the Middle East where you don't really deal with North Africa that much. But we are going to look a bit at developments there, uh, partly because one of the readings I'm assigning is connected to the uh, War of Independence in Algeria. Uh, so, you know, just to give a bit of background. Uh, and, you know, I think what will be apparent is that there, there's, uh, particularly since the advent of Islam, there's always been some kind of connection. Uh, though, again, very often developments happening uh, that are pretty much independent of what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, North Africa would include, of course, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, in theory, Egypt. But I think Egypt, in, in many ways, if you're telling the history of Egypt, it really does kind of link with the history of the Middle East much more closely. Now, one way in which uh, uh, the, middle, the uh, North Africa is quite different uh, from the Middle East has to do with kind of the dominant ethnicity, even though uh, in many of these countries, Arabic is in fact the, uh, one of the preeminent languages, or at least some dialect of it. And I should note, like the dialects of Arabic in North Africa, very different from what's spoken in the Middle East to the point where you know, even a native Arabic-speaking individual, for instance, a Palestinian, might have a great deal of trouble understanding Moroccan Arabic, just to give an example. I should have mentioned in the previous slide you had the term uh, Maghrib. Maghrib is kind of Arabic for, uh, literally means uh, lands to the west, right? So it's very often Maghrib is a term used to refer to North Africa. And in fact, uh, Morocco in Arabic is Al Maghrib, uh, Morocco, a kind of anglicizing of that term. Uh, being the furthest, uh, most western part of North Africa. But the people, uh, if we're talking about the people of North Africa, probably the dominant ethnicity are the Berbers. Uh, and you see a few uh, individual Berbers there, some of whom are famous. Uh, some of you who are uh, football slash soccer fans might recognize the fellow on the top with the blue shirt. Uh, in any event, um, so the, the term Berber actually going back to the Romans, referring to, you know, kind of people who were considered to be barbarian because they didn't speak Latin. Uh, so Berber kind of a uh, term for, I guess the, the English equivalent would be babble, right? like kind of s making kind of nonsensical sounds. Uh, in fact, the word in English barbarian comes from Berber. Uh, but they're, they're anything but, especially given that my, on my mother's side I'm descended uh, from people in Morocco, uh, granted of Jewish background, but likely people converted. I probably have some Berber blood uh, of my own. But in any event, uh, you do see successive waves of Arabs migrating into the area uh, over periods of time. Uh, so some people in North Africa, particularly in the larger cities, might claim to be of uh, uh, Arab descent. Uh, certainly many people are going to learn to speak Arabic, and that's why Arabic is uh, so commonly spoken. Uh, but, I mean, there, there, there are still people who speak Berber languages, particularly as you go into the interior. Now, probably, uh, you know, the first time that North Africa really becomes uh, strongly tied into the Middle East is with the creation of the Fatimid Empire, which we've already learned about uh, a long time ago, right? But it was a, one of the first Shiite empires. It actually started uh, in North Africa. Uh, Karawan was his first capital, but then eventually they conquered Egypt and built the city of Cairo, al Kahra. You might remember the Fatimid uh, Empire roughly corresponding to the time of the Crusades, uh, very often at odds with the Seljuks. But we're going to see a sequence of empires, and I have no expectation that you memorize all these different empires. There's not going to be you know, a question on the exam about it. Uh, but, you know, just... Uh, partly to get a sense of kind of the overarching history of the region, but also you, you kind of start to see uh, divisions emerging that roughly correspond to later modern nation states such as uh, Morocco and Tunisia. So, for instance, one of the earliest uh, dynasties, and, and all of them are going to be Islamic dynasties, one of the earliest is the Zurids. Uh, so they're a Berber dynasty. Uh, more or less based in what roughly corresponds to modern-day Tunisia and Algeria. 
initially vassals of the Fatimids, uh, but eventually becoming much more independent. Uh, the term Ifriqiya, by the way, back in the day, uh, literally it's Arabic for Africa, but it would have really corresponded to the uh, southern coastline of the Mediterranean. Uh, so the Zurids ruled for about two century, centuries and eventually were weakened by invading Arab tribes. Uh, and their capital was based in Karawam, which is in modern day Tunisia. And then another really uh, significant early dynasty are the Al Moravids. Uh, those who have made a religious retreat. So they kind of started out as a religious movement uh, among a particular group of Berbers, the Sanhaja Berbers of the Western Sahara. Uh, and so, you know, initially they became much more kind of militarily active in an attempt to impose a kind of a very strict moral discipline on the basis of Islam and to create kind of a society on that basis. Uh, so that's kind of how they eventually became a military movement. And by 1106, had conquered uh, Morocco, uh, so the Maghreb as far east as Algiers, uh, but also Spain up to the Ebro River. Uh, and I think, you know, roughly from this point forward, uh, you know, something we might call Morocco is beginning to emerge as a distinct entity. The Almoravids are followed by the Almohads, and that's another, initially, uh, again, starting as a Muslim Berber movement. Uh, that eventually became a political power in North Africa and Spain during the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, and they would be later pushed out of present-day Morocco by the Bani uh, Marin Berbers or Marinids, uh, with the last Almohad stronghold falling in 1271. And so at this point, you can kind of see that Morocco as a kind of distinct political entity is beginning to emerge. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you have other dynasties that are emerging in roughly what corresponds to Tunisia, uh, in Algeria, in the central Maghreb, you have the uh, Zionids who founded a dynasty at Tlemcen, uh, which is roughly today in uh, roughly what corresponds to the western part of Algeria. Uh, so the Zionists had links with the Almohads uh, and in fact presented themselves as their successors, but they were uh, uh, establishing their authority further east. Uh, and eventually the uh, Hafsids would establish their capital of Tunis. Uh, they also presented themselves as successors as the Almohads, so kind of two rival dynasties. This map kind of gives you an idea of where they're, they're based. Lemesin, you can kind of see, uh, is on the, near the border with Morocco. Tunis, of course, is the present-day capital of Tunisia. And then finally, we should make mention of the Saadis and Alawites who are going to both be based in Morocco. So kind of a consolidation of Moroccan identity uh, by this point. Uh, and so uh, both of these actually uh, correspond more or less to uh, periods when you had, uh, again, waves of Arab tribes that were migrating into North Africa. Uh, sometimes this was due to population pressures in, in Arabia. So. Uh, both of these claim to be descended, in fact, from the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, of course, this would be a way of kind of legitimizing your authority. The first was the Saadis who ruled Morocco from 1511 to 1659, uh, and they were followed by the Alawites, who actually uh, are still currently the rulers of Morocco, ruling there since the 17th uh, century. And around this time, uh, speaking of the 17th century, a little before that even, we're starting to see a growing European presence in North Africa, uh, particularly a Spanish one. Uh, so the Spanish are going to be establishing uh, kind of garrisons along the coastline known as presidios. Uh, and these, these are kind of like fortresses uh, that very often uh, eventually become the catalyst for cities. Uh, and they're there to protect, they're, they're there primarily to protect Spanish shipping in the Mediterranean uh, from pirates. And by the way, the, these presidios, the term presidio is actually used for uh, fortresses that were built uh, in, in the Americas, uh, including in North, in North America. In fact, there's a neighborhood uh, near the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco called the Presidio, and it's kind of a reference to what had been a Spanish fortress back in the day. Uh, speaking of piracy, right, this is a period also, the uh, 16th century, where North Africa is really going to become quite famous for pirates, right? So um, uh, you're going to see pirates kind of establishing bases of operation in North Africa. 
uh, probably most notably in Algiers. Uh, and this is also uh, the point at which North Africa is going to start to become connected to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and that kind of starts with, a, uh, with two brothers who were privateers, uh, initially operating out of Tunisia. Their names were Aruj and Khair ad-Din. Uh, and we've already met Khair ad-Din. He was known uh, to Europeans as Barroso or Red Beard because he had a red beard. Uh, so in 1516, Aruj moved his base of operations to Algiers. Uh, shortly after that, killed uh, and succeeded by his brother Khair ad uh, And at this point, uh, the basic deal was they were kind of recognized by the Ottoman Sultan in return for some measure of service and acknowledgement of some degree of Ottoman authority uh, in North Africa. But to a very great extent, Algiers would, would pretty much be autonomous. Uh, and it's probably its primary economic activity was piracy. Uh, in any event, Khayyadin, as you might recall, also ended up becoming the head of the Ottoman Navy. Uh, and connected with that, uh, he received, he became kind of uh, the person in charge in North Africa and Algiers, representing Ottoman authority there, under the title of Beylerbeg, uh, effectively a provincial governor. But again, to a very large degree, uh, they would be autonomous. So here we see the city of Algiers on the northern coast of Algeria, uh, again becoming kind of a major base of uh, piracy. Uh, they were known as the, uh, the Barbary Pirates. Uh, eventually they'll, they'll be harassing American shipping as well. That will lead to probably the first war after the United States became independent, uh, known as the Barbary Wars. Uh, I should point out, this is the modern part of the city of Algiers. Uh, so this was kind of constructed after Algeria became a French colony. And here we see Haradin or Barbaros in action on behalf of the Ottoman Navy. Uh, right? So he became uh, the admiral of the Ottoman Navy, even as he served as the, uh, the highest uh, Ottoman authority in Algiers, in North Africa. In fact, the title is given... Uh, was Day, uh, from 1671 onwards. That's the title that's given the rulers of Algeria. Uh, and again, even though they were in theory appointed by the Ottoman government, to a very large extent, uh, these individuals were chosen by local civilian military and pirate leaders. So the, the Ottoman uh, government wasn't going to appoint anyone not acceptable to them, and this reflected the fact that they were, again, very uh, much uh, kind of autonomous territories. Uh, now, these days would govern for life, uh, and they ruled with a high degree of autonomy. So, you know, the basic idea is they would have to provide some measure of revenue to the Ottoman uh, Sultan. Most of this revenue came from protection payments made by the Barbary pirates, uh, though they were also very active in the slave trade. Uh, and usually the, the people that they sold as slaves were individuals that had been captured by the pirates. Uh, and again, I mentioned that uh, at some point, uh, American shipping would be directly harassed, partly uh, at the uh, instigation of the British who promoted this, a uh, bit of revenge for having lost the colonies in the War of Independence. Uh, and so this led to the Barbary Wars, the First Barbary War and the Second Barbary War, uh, which uh, you know, was, again, probably the first proper war after the United States became independent. And uh, these pirates would also go after the British and French periodically. Here we see the bombardment of Algiers by the British Navy in 1816. Uh, but, you know, still managing to maintain their independence. That would finally change beginning in 1830. Uh, so here we see a French bombardment of Algiers. But this is a, you know, kind of a much more serious operation. This is about bringing Algiers under French control. Uh, and so this would eventually lead to Algeria becoming a French colony. Uh, according to the story, the, the reason why the French went after Algiers, why they bombarded it, was because a French diplomat had been insulted when he was slapped in the face with a white glove. One has to think that that was not the real uh, motivation behind this. This is a period where France is going to start trying to build up its empire. A after having lost most of its uh, imperial territory, uh, a few decades prior, uh, most of it to the British in North America. Uh, so Algeria, uh, the, the conquest of Algeria kind of marking the first step towards rebuilding the French Empire, which really, in the case of Algeria, doesn't get fully underway until Napoleon III, who we see there, who comes to power in 1848 in France, 
Uh, he is not Napoleon Bonaparte, by the way. He is the uh, nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, who becomes the French emperor, uh, first French president in 1848, then uh, shortly thereafter French emperor. Uh, and under his rule, pretty much all of Algeria will, will become a French colony. Now, uh, one thing that distinguishes Algeria as a colony from many other French colonies is that it's going to have a very large French settler population. Uh, so, you know, other French colonies like in Southeast uh, uh, Asia, you know, what corresponds to today uh, to Vietnam and uh, what was then known as Indochina, uh, you wouldn't see a large number of Frenchmen actually going there to settle. Uh, it's going to be different in Algeria. Some of this reflects proximity. Algeria is literally just across the Mediterranean from France. And so eventually you're going to have a large French settler population. Uh, and they're uh, often referred to by the term colons. Uh, and then against that, you're going to have kind of two other major components uh, in the population. Of course, you have the indigenous population. But very quickly, they're becoming kind of second-class citizens within their own country. And then finally, a very large French military presence in order to maintain uh, kind of control and maintain uh, the higher uh, status of the colons. So as you might imagine, uh, you know, particularly as you have more and more colons, Frenchmen who are settling in Algeria, who have a privileged position, this is going to create tremendous resentment among the native population, eventually leading to an insurrection in 1871. Now, the immediate catalyst for this was when the French started to extend civil authority to parts of Algeria that up until then had been somewhat self-governing, certain tribal reserves. And so kind of like how, you know, the United States would eventually break treaties that it made with Native Americans, uh, the French are going to do the same thing, where they abrogate previously made commitments that, among other things, also included material assistance for their subsistence. Uh, so, for instance, the French had promised uh, certain tribal chieftains to provide seed, uh, you know, for agricultural purposes. Uh, and now they repudiated these guarantees, basically said, we're not going to give you the seeds. So this led to an uprising, which the French were able to suppress pretty easily. Uh, but from that point forward, the French are going to rule over the native uh, Muslim population, excuse me, in, in, a, in a very oppressive manner, right? So they're going to impose very stringent measures to punish and control them. Uh, they're going to confiscate a lot of land. There's not going to be any self-governing reserves. And the region where the insurrection actually started is going to be especially harshly treated. They're pretty much put under military rule, uh, what the French call a régime d'exception or extraordinary rule. And here we see, uh, again, the development of the modern part of uh, Algiers, which is today the capital of Algeria. Uh, so... Uh, and this kind of represents a very typical pattern in North Africa with respect to European rule. Uh, eventually, most of North Africa coming under French rule, with the exception of Libya, which will come under Italian rule. Uh, and so what very often happens, like you'll have the old part of the city uh, with its winding, narrow alleyways. And, you know, this, this part of the city often referred to as the Casbah. And then you'll have this kind of modern part of the city. Uh, which is designed much more along European lines, you know, looking very European. Uh, but one major point is, is to, to realize that most resources are going to be diverted towards the modern part of the city, the European part, right? So that's part of what's creating resentment as well, right? So it's not just that, uh, in this case, the French colons have more political power within Algeria than the indigenous population, uh, but also they have access to more resources, whether you're talking about, you know, kind of money spent on infrastructure, uh, things like plumbing, good roadways, schools, uh, in terms of, you know, kind of better employment and things of that nature, everything is pretty much being diverted towards the French Cologne population. So where did that leave native Algerians? Uh, there really was only one pathway towards improving your situation, and that was to become more French, right, in the sense of being educated in a French school, learning to speak French fluently, and to some degree adopting French cultural mores and rejecting your own native ones, including those connected to Islam. Uh, and 
the term that the French used for such individuals, I think, tells you a lot about how they viewed the native population. They referred to them as being evolved. Uh, the term they used in French, evolu. Uh, so think about that. The idea that you have become a more superior person by virtue of becoming more French. Uh, the sad thing is, uh, you know, no matter how French you became, there really was a limit to how far you could advance. Uh, so you know, many of these individuals would hold white-collar jobs, but rarely higher than the level of clerk. You were really never going to achieve any kind of meaningful political position within the administration or a higher position within, you know, whatever business you might work in. Um, you probably weren't really even uh, able to live in the modern part of the city. You still had to reside in the Casbah. But think about how you've also kind of, you know, lost connection to where you came from, right? So you end up in this kind of, you know, in-between uh, region, between being fully Algerian and being fully French. Uh, you know, the French were very proud of themselves. To the extent that Algerians adopted French ways, they imagined that they were helping to civilize them. This was seen as kind of a desired end product of a, uh, what the French saw as an assimilation policy. But again, they never really fully assimilated them. Uh, even if they did kind of, you know, give them certainly a better position relative to native Algerians, right? So they, they might end up acting as kind of intermediaries, you know, in terms of administration for dealing with local Algerians. But that was pretty much about it. So we're going to stop the first half of the lecture here uh, and pick up by looking at developments in other parts of North Africa, but eventually coming back uh, to Algeria in time for the War of Independence.